This is the best known example of the effects of the dynamics of air in motion. We've all tried it. Instead of a hand, substitute the wings of a Boeing jetliner in flight. This sketch shows the airfoil's curved upper surface and relatively flat lower surface combined with its angle of attack. The flow of air is accelerated above the airfoil and is slower below it. This creates an area of low pressure above the wing and higher pressure below it. The difference between these pressures is called lift. Increasing the airfoil's angle of attack or the upper surface curvature will increase lift. There is a limit to how much air can be accelerated around an airfoil. When this limit is reached, a stall occurs and the wing loses lift. The air's resistance to airplane movement is called drag. It's a flight factor that design engineers and manufacturing people, among others, must take into consideration. This chart shows a breakdown of drag. The first part represents drag caused by air rubbing against the shape of the airplane. The next part is drag due to lift, or the aerodynamic price of lifting weight. The drag total is completed with the amount due to compressibility. This compressibility effect is due to the increasing inability of the surrounding air to get out of the way of the oncoming airplane as it gains speed. During flight, the pilot relies on control surfaces to maneuver the airplane. They are the elevators, the rudder, and the ailerons. The ailerons allow the airplane to roll. The rudder is used for yaw. And the elevators for pitch. A combination of these give the airplane maneuverability. The way the airplane responds to the control and how it feels to the pilots is called handling characteristics. It's very important that the airplanes of the same model handle consistently from one to the other. With that as background material, let's head for the factory and look into some specific components, why they are there and how they affect aerodynamics. Both the 737 and 757 are designed and built to provide specific fuel burn and performance levels. Levels based on customer expectations and regulatory requirements. The better the aerodynamics are maintained, the closer our airplanes will perform to these specification levels. That, in turn, will enable us to remain competitive in the marketplace. It may seem obvious, but there's a reason for everything attached to an airplane. And for every item, there's a correct location and orientation. Let me draw your attention to the 737 wing. Boeing wings are optimized primarily for cruise conditions. However, performance can be improved at other speeds by tailoring some external features. For example, those small tabs on top of the wing. They're vortex generators, BGs for short. They were added to the wing to improve its high-speed handling characteristics at Buffett, speeds faster than cruising conditions. Also, the VGs can help postpone the onset of Buffett. The vortex generators energize the airflow so that the wing behaves differently Specifically, they delay the onset of airflow separation at the wing's trailing edge. VGs also were added in front of the ailerons because at low angles of attack and at very high speed, the ailerons had a tendency to vibrate. The VGs eliminated that unacceptable vibration. Vortex generators were added between the horizontal and vertical tail sections. The modification was made during the 737-400 flight test program in order to decrease elevator vibration at very high speeds. A vortex control device, a VCD for short, was added to each engine cowl on the 737. The VCDs increased the wing's maximum lift capability and reduced the stall speed, allowing the 737 to use shorter runways. The devices do this by delaying the vortex burst from the engines. 
Speaking of lift, slats and flaps are used to alter the wing's shape for the slower speeds of takeoff and landing. Slats are the wing's leading edge devices. Another type of extension, called a Kruger flap, reaches out from the lower wing surface. Trailing edge devices are called flaps, and on Boeing planes can be made up of from one to three elements. The high lift system, being extended out and down, increases the wing's curvature, allowing slower speeds without stalling, and enabling the airplane to carry more weight at low speed. Even minor rigging adjustments to the flaps will change the lift distribution on the wing. That causes increased drag and changes the airplane's handling characteristics. To clean up a bow wake effect, bearings called strakelets are used to reduce drag at the junctions of the wing and body, the horizontal tail and body, and between the wing and nacelle strut. Other fairings are designed to reduce the drag caused by necessary protuberances. For example, the fairings that cover the flap tracks. These are streamlined coverings over the bulky flap drive mechanisms. And another is the wing to body fairing, which also covers the landing gear. The airplane's flight crew depends on the airspeed system to correctly indicate speed and altitude. In fact, many of the plane's systems depend on these accurate readings. However, any small protrusions near the ports and probes can disturb the airflow, and that in turn can affect the measurements. As an example, if a flush static port sits out of tolerance high by just three thousandths of an inch, the result can be an unacceptably inaccurate altitude indication. To put that in perspective, three thousandths of an inch is equal to the width of a human hair. Beginning with the nose and continuing to the tail, the engineering and manufacturing goal is to give Boeing planes the best combination of aerodynamics, weight, cost, manufacturability, and maintainability. To accomplish that, Boeing must wage a constant battle against drag in order to retain the original performance capabilities of each model. Let's take the 757 as an example. 86.5% of its total drag is unavoidable. None of us can do anything about that percentage. It's due to the craft's size and shape and the lift the wings must generate. Another 8.5% can be optimized in the wind tunnel through factors like minimizing the natural interference of the plane's major components. Once the design is frozen, there's only 5% of total drag that we can do something about. This is called excrescence drag, and it includes all deviations from a smooth surface. This 5% is extremely important to our product's overall performance. This is how we retain our competitiveness in the marketplace. During past excrescence drag programs, lack of attention to detail resulted in costly corrective measures to avoid losing customers. In order to meet the predicted performance levels, drawing and tooling changes were necessary, along with extensive flight tests, and all those corrective measures were costly to Boeing. When dealing with excrescence drag, the airplane has critical areas, shaded in orange, and non-critical areas. Excrescence items cause the greatest amount of drag when they're located in critical areas. Excrescence drag is broken into four categories. Discrete items, mismatches like gaps and cavities, air leakage, and roughness. Discrete items include things like antennas, drain masts, or other features that are added for some specific reason after the basic airplane configuration is determined. Mismatches can occur in manufacturing. Their effect on performance can be great. In general, a mismatch that faces into the wind affects performance one and a half to two times more than one facing away from the wind. Some gaps and cavities have to be designed into the airplane. For example, gaps are needed to create interference-free doors. The gaps should be kept as small as possible and sealed whenever possible. This unsealed gap at the bottom of the radome fulfills a drainage requirement. A seal is used between the slats to stop leakage of air from the lower surface to the upper surface of the wing. Without the seal, the air would be sucked from the lower to upper surface. This robs the local airflow of energy. The result? 
is dragged. This also can affect the airflow downstream of this leakage, and that could result in separation of flow and additional drag, or even worse, the loss of critical lift. Things like rough paint, surface waviness, and poorly seated rivets can cause local disturbances at the price of additional drag. It may seem small, but in general, anything sticking out more than one thousandth of an inch causes drag. To track excrescence drag, aerodynamics personnel in Renton perform smoothness inspections each year on three 737s and two 757s. That gives you an overview of aerodynamics and drag. Now let's see how excrescence drag and aerodynamic components influence manufacturing and design problems. Watch this. Rather startling, wasn't it? That was an actual problem we had to work through. During B-1 flights, while checking auto slat operation, the Boeing flight crews found that the 737 aircraft would roll, usually to the left, prior to the slat extension. The roll occurred when the slat was in the intermediate position, as it would be during takeoff. With a very good hint from one of our production flight test pilots, uh, we homed in on that there was a possibility that the slat was moving. With some flight testing and some diagnostics, we determined that what was happening was the slat was indeed being sucked out by air loads. The slat motion is programmed by an auxiliary track, and this dwell point or low point on this track is the uh, takeoff position. And what we determined was that the slats were not being rigged with the appropriate retention load to hold the slat in the takeoff position prior to the auto slat deploying. Once we got the slats rigged properly, the problem went away and we had airplanes we could deliver again. Through the cooperation of manufacturing and engineering, the situation was successfully resolved and the solution eliminated rework on that problem. Another recent aerodynamic problem involved the 757. The wedge attached to the slat upper surface trailing edge was delaminating and in a very few cases actually departing the airplane. In solving that problem, we learned a valuable lesson, which is to have increased communication when designing parts so that everyone understands what's important in the design of the airplane so that we design a, a part that has structural integrity that satisfies its function and need. Another problem we've had on the 757 was back in 1990, the pilots prior to delivery reported a buzz in their hands in the control column. Some detective work determined that the aileron was vibrating, which was driving the cables, being felt as the buzz in the cockpit. Some investigation into the problem, though, found that the real problem was that the fixed trailing edge panels ahead of the aileron was what was vibrating and driving the aileron as a secondary effect. When I look back into the history of the 757, it was determined that a design change was made that changed the stiffness of those fixed trailing edge panels. So the fix became to change the stiffness one more time by adding a beam along the trailing edge of those fixed trailing edge panels. Thus the vibration went away and we could continue to deliver airplanes. Small changes in flap rigging, wing location, or positioning of the tail sections can result in an airplane that will not fly straight and level. To enable that airplane to fly properly then, the flaps have to be re-rigged to correct for these abnormalities. Of course, that means additional rework and additional flight checks. Even when the airplane flies acceptably, not maintaining wing component alignments can result in added drag because of the optimum wing shape being altered. That added drag would make our airplanes less competitive in the marketplace. Rejection tags. They're used to bring discrepancies to the attention of engineering. These tags are evaluated by Liaison Engineering for acceptance. Liaison coordinates with Aerodynamics Engineering when evaluating rejection tags for possible impact on airplane performance or safety of flight. Any problem that affects handling characteristics or flight safety must be fixed prior to delivery. Compared to the examples I just gave you, each rejection tag is relatively small but the cumulative number of tags is not small. 
So we try to establish limits for tags, limits that are acceptable to liaison and aerodynamics engineering. If a tag is written on every airplane, it's usually made into a green line. They result in evaluations aimed at fixing the problem or revising the engineering definition if it's a manufacturability issue. There was a problem of excessive rejection tags on the 757 Rolls-Royce engine to sell. A design build team that includes Rolls-Royce was put together to evaluate the problem. And Rolls-Royce engineers came up with a suggestion. Roger Krebs. The problem stemmed from the fact that we were taking nearly 600 measurements on every nacelle and any single measurement could generate a rejection tag. Two of our most problem areas were the forward and the aft end of the fan cowl and we were getting rejection tags on every nacelle coming through. And we worked on the quality of the hardware and we got it to a place where we felt we had very good quality hardware but we were still rejecting a point here and a point there and there was no way we could get rid of the rejection tags. So we started thinking, is there a way that we could measure the nacelle and inspect for quality and not reject a good nacelle? And we came up with an idea of using an averaging tolerancing method where we would average the points around a particular position and that would control the quality and uh, the fit and fair at each location. The maximum limit would control the cosmetic appearance at any single point so that it wasn't sticking out too far. And actually this has worked out very well for us. Our rejection tags have dropped dramatically. This works for some areas, but the practice has to be watched closely so as not to disguise real problem areas. During this study, some tooling was changed to correct the nacelle problem. So the product did get better as a result of the process. Many of the air intakes require aerodynamic devices like this to obtain the proper flow of air required by the component. It may need a deflection device for things like a higher rate of airflow or more pressure recovery. Noise is another factor we must consider. Interior and exterior noise. A lot of interior noise is associated with air leakage around windows and doors. The noise aerodynamics engineering is normally involved in is externally generated noise caused by the flow of air on the outside of the airplane. For example, a tone that was detected from the inside of the passenger cabin on the 757. The problem we had was that prior to delivery we had an unacceptable noise that was radiating uh, near a passenger seat over the wing. The noise was coming out of a air conditioning fresh air return duct. Uh, we then had to find out why the noise was there and where it was coming from. Uh, after several flights, we chased the problem out to the slat here by the side of the body. But that still didn't tell, tell us where on the slat the noise is coming from. So working with the noise engineering staff, we instrumented the airplane with microphones and accelerometers looking for where the noise was the loudest. What that did was allow us to locate the problem on the slat and it turned out to be that we had a manufacturing problem with the trailing edge of the slat. It wasn't fitting up tightly to the fixed leading edge. That allowed it to uh, buzz freely in the aerodynamic uh, load environment and vibrate like the reed of a clarinet, providing a very consistent tone that was very, very loud that then caused the whole slat to act like an organ pipe to amplify the sound and then cause it to radiate in through the structure into the passenger cabin and come out the air conditioning fresh air return duct. A lot of detective work. We worked the problem and, and found the cause and solved it. As tolerances are important to performance, so are external repairs once the airplane is flying. Our support of airplane performance doesn't stop when the plane is delivered. In this video, we've shown how Boeing handles the aerodynamic areas of the airplane and how these things can affect the customer. Generally, excrescence-type items increase fuel burn and have the same effect as adding weight to the airplane. A positive step of adding just the thickness of a dime to the upper wing surface front spar would result in a penalty to the customer equal to adding 200 pounds of weight to the 737 or an extra 250 pounds for the 757.
The fuel burn penalty to the customer in that example would be an extra 2,800 gallons a year for the 737 or 3,200 extra gallons a year for the 757. Aerodynamics engineering is part of the build team, helping to evaluate any aerodynamic impact it may have and to offer alternatives based on the best combination of aerodynamics, weight, cost, manufacturability, and maintainability. In short, with engineering and manufacturing working together, we can achieve quality and customer satisfaction.